Our Lord, we thank you for your word, especially these first principles from the book of Genesis. We pray that you would bless us as we hear these important words about covenant today. May they be preached and heard as they really are the word of God and not mere philosophies of men. Bless your people for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we just prayed, the topic this morning is covenant. In executing his worldwide judgment on wicked mankind through a worldwide flood, God did a miraculous work of mercy in saving Noah and his family. Although millions were wiped out, eight people were saved because God shined his electing favor onto Noah and his family. Genesis 6, 8. And in 6, 8, we see an amazing statement. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, God elected Noah. God elected Noah in eternity past and saved him. And this was the beginning of the account of Noah. But after this great flood and deliverance, we see another amazing statement. Beginning in chapter 9, verse 8, Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. This is an amazing follow-up to an amazing promise that God made in 618. He said there, I will establish my covenant with you, uh, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. So as we leave the flood account behind, let us take uh, some time this morning to examine covenant. Not just covenant with Noah, but covenant with all of God's people. See, this is the normal way of God relating to his people is through covenant. So point number one, the covenant is unilateral. Unilateral simply means one-sided. This promise to establish a covenant in Genesis 6 is the first explicit use of the term covenant in our Bible. From the outset, it is clear that God is the actor in this covenant situation and that man is subordinate. Notice here that it is God who acts first. He announces the covenant in 618, I will establish. He declares the covenant in our text this morning, 9-9, I now establish. And we see that man is passive on both accounts. If this seems awfully one-sided to you, God coming and dictating a covenant, if that seems one-sided, then I say, praise the Lord. God must be the prime and first mover in relationship with man. First, because man is dead, spiritually dead, dead in his transgressions and sins. It is axiomatic, of course, that the dead can do nothing. So without God to move, without God to act upon dead man, we would remain dead in our transgressions and sins. Second, sinful man hates God. The theological term is enmity, but sinful man is deeply and actively opposed to God and hostile to God. And that way he's worse than dead. At least the dead are, in relative terms, neutral. They don't do anything. But we are spiritually dead, but actively opposed to God. So we sometimes shorthand this by saying hatred, but hatred does not quite cover the full scope of man's uh, againstness as to God. There is a deep and fundamental againstness in the core of our nature as fallen men. We see a glimpse of this in Psalm 2. The nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain against God. The kings of the earth gather together and take their stand against the Lord. Let us break their chains. Let us throw off their fetters. You see the the rebellion and the againstness as to God. Or we see in Acts chapter 7, as the godly Stephen preaches the gospel to the assembled, they gnash their teeth at him against God. They cover their ears and they yell at the top of their voices and drag Stephen away and stone him to death at the mere mention of Jesus Christ. No, 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 man says. There is no God. Shut your mouth or we will kill you. A deep, deep againstness. 
The same leaders that stoned Stephen to death produced false testimony against Jesus. They bribed the guards to cover up his resurrection, which was told to them in advance. See, the point is the truth, reality does not matter. Man is against God, regardless of evidence, regardless of the cost. And in case you think you might be better off, modern man is in fact no better. He hates the very idea of the God of the Bible, a moral, authoritative, holy God. So man in modern man invents false gods, idols, mythologies, and so on. He worships detestable demons who let him sin all he wants. He posits atheism. See, we all came from nothing with no cause and for no reason with nothing to live for and no purpose to our existence. That, that's the modern man's great contribution to philosophy. You see, man would rather believe that he is a cosmic accident, a cruel and farcical joke of a creature, than to believe that he is made in the image and likeness of God and for the purpose of eternal fellowship, joy, and worship with this God. Modern man says there is no God, even though he knows that that statement is a lie. 1 John 2, 22. He knows the God of the Bible, but he suppresses that truth by his wickedness, sinning and sinning and sinning the more so as to sear his conscience as with a hot iron. Romans 1, 18 and 1 Timothy 4. See, from the fall in the garden to this very day, the default of man has been enmity, hatred, and againstness towards God. So, modern man is dead. All men are dead. Uh, man is against God, has a deep enmity to God. But there's a third reason God must be the first mover in any relationship with man, which is even if we were not dead... And even if we did not harbor a great and fundamental enmity toward God, we have nothing to offer God in this relationship. It is hard to make a two-sided deal when you have nothing to offer the other party. We have nothing material to offer. God owns everything. Psalm 24, verse 1. In fact, God created us. So he owns us. Hebrews 1, 2. Everything there is, he created the whole universe and everything in it. And if the world was lacking something that God deemed to be good, he could simply create it by fiat, by his spoken word, as he did in Genesis 1, 1. In fact, our ongoing existence requires God's affirmative action, sustaining us, uh, as it says in Hebrews 1, 3, sustaining all things, including us, by his powerful word. So when your existence depends on the affirmative action of another, of another party, this is what is called a bad bargaining position. <laughs> we simply have nothing that God requires, desires, or benefits from. He is perfect in every respect and fully self-existent. Acts 17, 25, he has no need of anything. Before creation, before anything else existed, God dwelt in a perfect state of perfect fellowship in perfect happiness in the Holy Trinity. So if God did not move first to make covenant with man, on what basis would we go to God and say, let's make a deal? What would we offer to God in our deal? What deal would we even propose? Why would he even entertain that deal? much less accept it. In fact, we could not even approach him if he did not draw us to himself. See, he dwells in unapproachable light, it says in 1 Timothy 6, 16. If you think you could approach God, perhaps on the basis of your good deeds or righteousness, I have bad news, Isaiah 64, 6 says, all our righteous acts are as filthy rags. Habakkuk 1.13 says his eyes are too pure to look upon evil, and yet we are covered in it. Notice also, or so, so covenant with God is indeed one-sided. It is indeed pure mercy by God to us, and thank God for that one-sidedness. And notice that we may get confused on this subject, but God is not confused. 
Genesis 6, 18, when he announces this covenant in advance to Noah, he says, I will establish my covenant with you. He's not confused about uh, what we have to offer. And when he comes back to establish it in Genesis 9, he says, I now establish my covenant with you. So a few things you can notice here. He does not propose a covenant with us. He does not suggest a covenant with us. He does not offer a covenant with us, if we're interested. No, he establishes it. He declares it to be. No counter signature by us is necessary. See, it is God who is doing all the work in this relationship. Genesis 9, 12, the covenant I am making. 9, 17, the covenant I have established. Mankind with Noah and sons and wives as our representatives, mankind does not even have a speaking role in this covenant ceremony. Genesis 6, look at who's doing all the speaking. Genesis 6, 18, I will establish. 9, 9, I now establish. 9, 17, I have established. So, so future, present, past, it's God who's speaking all the time. Man is simply on the receiving end of this covenant relationship. There is not even an I accept or an okay recorded in here. And notice also God uses the language of ownership to indicate it's not our covenant, it's his covenant. 6.18, he calls it my covenant. 9.9, 9, he calls it my covenant again. 9.15, my covenant. See, he moves. He acts. He establishes. He sets the terms. He owns it. He does it for his purposes and on his terms. Noah and mankind whom he represents are simply along for the ride. This is by no means limited to Noah, lest you think I am cherry picking language. God created Adam in the garden and then Eve, and he made a covenant with them, blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. It doesn't use the, the word covenant, but it's clearly a covenant relationship. You see, again, it is unilateral. He did not consult Adam on whether he wanted to be made. He did not consult Adam on whether Eve was to be made. He did not consult them on what the rules were in the garden. He simply acted. The same thing is true with God's covenant with Abraham. We see in Genesis 15, verse 2, I am your shield and your very great reward. This is the basic covenant. I will be your God and you will be my people. Genesis 17, 2. Listen to the parallel language. I will confirm my covenant. Sounds a lot like the language used with Noah. Verse 4. This will be my covenant. Verse 9. You must keep my covenant. You and your descendants after you. Or as we look uh, further in God's relationship with Israel... He uses the same kind of language. We're reading through the book of Exodus now. It says, God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant. It's God's covenant. He didn't remember their joint shared agreement. God remembered his covenant. Genesis, uh, Exodus 6, 4, I have established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan. Or verse 5, I have remembered my covenant. 19, verses 3 and 5, say to the people, keep my covenant. Now, this is fairly interesting since these are Abraham's descendants. They're, they're mentioned earlier. Uh, God made his covenant with uh, Abram's descendants and with Noah's descendants. So these people are all in that line. But they do not even appear to know God. They don't even know his name. Remember when uh, Moses says, who am I going to tell them sends me? And they said, uh, tell them I am. They didn't even know his name, and yet he has a covenant with them. They don't have any independent agreement with God, but God has established his covenant with Noah and his descendants, Abram and his descendants, and these are those people. It does not matter that they don't know his name or that they don't have their own independent agreement. God's covenant remains in force. God remembers it, and God will fulfill it. So it is indeed a one-sided deal, and praise God, it is a one-sided deal. He is one-sidedly faithful to keep his covenant. 
Now, God made a similar arrangement with David and used similar covenant language. 2 Samuel 7, 8. Listen to who's acting. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to make you ruler over my people. David was not consulted in this matter. Now I will make your name great and provide a place for my people Israel. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you and I will establish his kingdoms. And then a bunch of blessings and curses follow after that. So same type of arrangement. God comes to David who's off dealing with sheep and God declares a covenant with him. God's covenant with us, his present day people, is also one-sided. God elected us in eternity past. Now, it doesn't get any more one-sided than that. We were not around. We did not get a vote. We did not even exist at that time. God called us in time by his irresistible grace. Our pastor said yesterday, you can resist all you want, but God will overcome your resistance. God did everything. God the Father decreed the salvation plan. God the Son achieved it in time. Jesus Christ, very God, become man, lived a perfect life of perfectly holy obedience, bore the infinite wrath of God that was due to us, and died the death that we deserved that we might live. And at least uh, from our perspective, that all happened about 2,000 years ago uh, before we were even born, before our farthest ancestors back that we can remember were even born. One-sided deal. He took all our sin on himself and he put all his merit onto us that we might be justified, that we might be qualified for eternal life with God in glory. This is a double transaction. It took place before we existed. And then God, the Holy Spirit, applied this redemption to us in time, in our lives, moving in us by the Holy Spirit to give us a new heart and a new spirit so that we could cry out in faith and say, have mercy on me, a sinner. And if you go back and read that passage from Ezekiel, Pastor read it this morning to some elders, you will see that it is God doing all the work. I will put my spirit in you and move you. I will, I will, I will, I will. Man is on the receiving end. It is all of God. So this uh, uh, new heart and new spirit, this is called regeneration. Us dead sinners are made alive. And so you can see the deal is still one-sided, and praise God, it is one-sided. He found us dead in our transgressions and sins, doomed to eternal hell without hope, and he one-sidedly said, live. We are redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. You see this unilateral covenant? We don't like unilateral things, but this unilateral covenant is a covenant of unilateral grace. From Noah and even before that, through Abraham, the Israelites, and David, all the way down to us, it is a covenant of God's grace. We have no right to ask God for anything. We have nothing to offer and nothing to give. We have no merit. There is nothing good in ourselves when God comes to us and says, live. We have nothing, and yet because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. St. Paul continues, it is by grace you have been saved. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. See, it is all of God, 100%. Even my saving faith, even that is of God. Ephesians 2, 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this, not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by our works, so that no one can boast. In other words, no one can say, I did it. I chipped in. Even our repentance is a gift of God. Acts eleven eighteen. God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Acts 5, 31. God gave repentance and, and forgiveness to Israel. 2 Timothy 2, 25. Speaking of sinners... Paul prays, Paul says that God may grant them repentance. 
It's a grant. It's a gift. Grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. See, it is all a gift of God. It is all the grace and the grace of God. Now, we're left to ask the question, why? Why would God do this? I spent all this time explaining that we have nothing to offer and he has nothing to gain. So why would God do this? Why would God make a covenant with Noah? We look at Noah. Talk about nothing to offer. He's fresh off the boat with nothing to give. He barely survived this cataclysmic flood. And even that was because God made it happen. Why a covenant with him? Why a covenant with Abram, a wanderer with nothing? He didn't even own a foot of ground. He didn't even know where he was going. Why would God make a covenant with stateless Israelites living in bondage in Egypt? Why would God make a covenant with a no-name shepherd of so little account that when it was time to pick a king, they did not even call him in from the sheep to be considered? Why would God make a covenant and choose ordinary, unschooled fishermen? Why would God make a covenant with you, with me, or with our brother, Ron Gooley? Why? Well, I already gave you the answer. His great love and rich mercy. See, God loved us because he loved us. There was nothing good in us, nothing for him to gain from us. It is simply his nature, his good nature, his rich and merciful nature. See, we think sometimes God picked me because I am special, but we've got it backwards. It is I am special because God picked me. So praise the Lord. It is a unilateral covenant, and we must praise God for his unilateral covenant. Next point, it is a communal covenant. In this case, we could say a family covenant. Both the promise in Genesis 6 and the established covenant in Genesis 9 were not merely for Noah, but for his family also. Now, of course, they obviously benefited from the uh, relationship that Noah had with God. Uh, they got to go in the ark and live and not die in the flood. That's a pretty good outcome. But there is greater benefit than just this collateral benefit of living. You know, they are made part of the covenant. Genesis 9 verses 8 and 9 goes even farther than just you get to live. It, God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you. It's not just a covenant with Noah. It's a covenant with those sons. It is clear that Noah's sons are part of the covenant, not merely collateral beneficiaries. They are members. They are included, included by God's decree. Now, they also demonstrated faith, their responsive faith. They believed God's word delivered through Noah, the man of God. They obeyed God's word, acted upon that belief by uh, helping construct and entering the ark. And see, they were chosen by God included by God and regenerated by God, the proof being their obedience of faith. And yet God goes even further than that. See, the promise is not just for uh, Mr. and Mrs. Noah or Mr. and Mrs. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The promise is, it says, for you and your descendants after you. Genesis 9, 9. A people not yet born a people existing only in the mind of God and yet brought into covenant relationship with God, his covenant of grace by his divine and merciful decree. See, it's not just God makes a covenant with people who exist. He makes a generational covenant. And this is God's way. This is his general way, generational relationship. We'll see it soon in our reading and preaching as we approach Abraham. Genesis 17, 9. God says, a covenant for you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. So also with Jacob in Genesis 35. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac I also give to you and I will give this land to your descendants after you. God is, by nature, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, and he shows, by nature, love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. 
Of course, we know that this is not some mere uh, racial, family, or national inheritance when God speaks of their descendants. He speaks of their descendants as the people who will live by faith. See, Esau was a biological son and yet excluded from the covenant, not a spiritual son. Romans 9, 13. We are heirs not of some DNA, not of some culture, not of some continual national government. We are heirs of a righteousness that comes by faith. Hebrews eleven seven. The covenant is with those who have faith in God. The covenant is with us who put our faith in God by his grace. See, Abraham is the father of all who believe, not just all who were born of him. God has always operated on this generational scale, and he still does. Acts 2, 39, the promise is for you and your children, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Before we were born, God brought us into his covenant in eternity past. Before the cross, before the exodus, before the flood, before all time in eternity past, God chose us and called us and elected us to salvation that he might always have a people to praise him and to spread his gospel, to declare his glories until he comes again with glory. It is a generational covenant. Point number three, it is a certain covenant. God's covenant in fact, God in general is not wishy-washy. What he says, he does, and what he says, he says with certainty. With God, it is not hope so. His yes is yes, and his no is no. Look at the strength of the language in Genesis 9. I establish. It's done. It's not I will try. It's not I will put the pieces together. I establish. God speaks it, and it is done. Never again, he says, never again will I wipe out everyone by a worldwide flood. Verse 11. Verse 15, never again. He even gives a sign of the covenant, a rainbow, in verses 13 and 17. And it says there that when God sees the rainbow, he'll remember the covenant. Well, the truth is, it's not really for him to see it and remember. He doesn't forget. It is for us to know with certainty that he remembers. It is to give assurance, blessed assurance for an otherwise shaky people. God said he would settle Abram in a land that he would show Abram, and he would make Abram into a great nation and bless him. And he did it. He said he would give Abram a son from his own body, even though he was super old and his wife was super old. God said he would give them a son from their own body to be the heir, and he did. He told Moses that he would lead the Israelites out of Egypt and that they would plunder the mighty Egyptians. It seemed impossible, but they did it. God did it. He promised to lead the unarmed, untrained refugees into a promised land after 40 years of wandering in the desert, and he did it. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel failed. Every one of his promises was fulfilled. Joshua 21, 45. And it goes farther. He promised to send a Messiah, born of a virgin, riding on a colt out of Bethlehem, Nazareth, and Egypt to obey him perfectly, to bear his wrath that was due for us and to die for our sins and to be raised for our justification. He promised it and he did it. And he promises now to work all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose and to lead us to an eternal glory with him. And he has done it and he will do it. See, God's covenant is sure and certain because God is sure and certain. Man may make a promise and fail to keep that promise. We are sinners. We lie and we deceive. We change our minds. Or we intend to do it, but we are too weak to accomplish it. We are unable. We lack the resources, whatever it is. We try and we fail. See, every promise of man is inherently contingent inherently dependent 
But God suffers from no such problems. He has no such uncertainty. His promises are sure. He does not forget. He does not lie. And he cannot fail. If I am in Christ, then everything that happens to me is for my good. God says so. Romans 8, 28. God says so, and therefore I know so. My chronic illness is for my good. My singleness or barrenness is for my good. My job loss is for my good. The death of my beloved brother is for my good. My own death in God's good timing is for my good. Nothing bad can happen to me if I am in Christ. God promises and his promises are sure. His covenant is certain. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And the answer is nothing. The world, the false brothers, and the devil may come after me. They will come after me. They can do nothing. They cannot even touch a hair of my head. Luke 21, 18. My own flesh, my own thoughts may oppose me. But I can say no to sin and yes to righteousness by God's grace. I can discipline my flesh and make it obey me. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. I can take every thought captive for Christ. I don't have to be a victim to my thoughts. I don't have to be at the mercy of my emotions. God says I can take every thought captive. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. God says I can do all things, all things, hard as they are, through him who strengtheneth me. I can be a super conqueror full of super abounding grace because God promised and he will deliver. His promises are sure. Now, the truth is, it, often we don't know how God will keep up his end of the covenant, his end of the bargain. It can be very mysterious to us. It can seem impossible to us. Noah had to build the giant ship. It doesn't say this in the Bible, but I have to believe Noah thought, I don't know. That's a big boat. <laughs> Abraham was told, take your son, your only son, your son Isaac, the son of the promise, the son who this Messiah was going to go uh, come from. Take him and kill him and burn him up. I don't know how that's going to work out. Joseph was made a slave and falsely imprisoned. I don't know how that's going to work out for the good of those who love him. These walls of Jericho are going to come down when we go around it and blow our trumpets and yell at it. I don't know. A Christ who would achieve our eternal salvation by his unjust and excruciating death. I don't know. Understanding how is often difficult. But we can always know and rest in the certainty that God will keep his covenant and perform his vows. Even when we do not know how, we know who. We know God and he will do it for sure. Just look back at chapter 9. The rainbow still shines as a reminder. The worldwide flood has not come again, even though the inclinations of man's heart are still only evil all the time. He continues to save the sons of Noah. See, he has kept his covenant. He is keeping his covenant. He will keep his covenant. God's covenant promises are sure because God is sure. Let us always trust in him and give him all the glory when it comes to pass. And point number four, final point, covenant requires obedience. Just because God's covenant is all of grace, just because it is by God's unilateral actions, just because it is all free of cost does not mean it is free of obligation. We must obey our covenant Lord. This is a key covenant term. Modern antinomian evangelicalism has lost the plot. See, they say, because salvation is all of God and free of cost, 
then it is free of obligation. I don't have to do anything. False. Look at the terms in chapter 9. There is a lot of obligation on Noah and his family and his descendants. Chapter 9, verses 1 and 7, God commands them, be fruitful and multiply. It's the same command from 128. See, the terms don't change. Chapter 9, verse 4, you must not eat meat that still has the lifeblood in it. See, God came and unilaterally established the covenant, but those covenant terms have things that they are supposed to do, things that they must do. It is not free of obligation. The essence of every covenant with God is the same. I will be your God and you will be my people. I will command you in the way you should go and you will obey me. That's the deal. There will be blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. Genesis 17, we see uh, uh, different terms. You must be circumcised. That's new. It's a sign of the covenant. It's not achieving the covenant, but it's a sign of the covenant. The circumcised people are the people who declare fealty to the covenant. Deuteronomy 28, classic chapter, we've preached on it many times, lays out the covenant obligations as well as the curses for disobedience and the blessings for obedience. See, the situation has not changed today. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We cannot earn our salvation. We cannot contribute to it in any way. God's covenant is still unilateral, just like it was way back when. But just like it was way back then, it is not free of obligation for us. Indeed, it is clear now that our obligation is total. 100% of our obedience for 100% of the time for 100% of the years of our life. In big matters or small matters, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we must do it all for God's glory. That is according to his word. We cannot glorify God by our disobedience to his word. We can only glorify him by obeying and testifying about him. If, if it's not good enough for you, I would point you to John 17, 4. Jesus said, I have glorified the Father by obeying him. We are to glorify God by demonstrating our love for him in keeping his commands. John 14, 15. God saved us. God gave us eternal life by paying the highest price ever paid. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus paid it all and it is fully paid and no more is needed. We do not need to obey to add to what Jesus did. We do not need to obey to complete his work or participate in it. His infinite sacrifice is sufficient. No, we obey as a thank offering to God, a joyful and loving response to our God and his Christ who paid it all for us. There is indeed a yoke of obedience to God's word, which we must bear. And he gives us the grace to bear it. But his yoke is easy and his burden is light. His yoke keeps us on the straight and narrow way, which leads to eternal life of glory and of joy. Even that yoke is for our good. So you might ask, what about that disobedient Christian? Well, for such a person, there is discipline, pain, trouble, frustration, loss, holes in the purse, weakness, sickness, even death itself. King David experienced it. His disobedience and adultery led to the death of a child. It led to great personal shame and disgrace for David. It led to a bloody civil war and the wiping out of many people. But David repented and was saved. And at the end of his life, he departed to glory. He sinned, he experienced discipline, and he repented and went to eternal life. Or consider the immoral brother of 1 Corinthians 5. He was expelled from the assembly. That's serious discipline. Cut off from the means of grace. And verse 5 Severe discipline, hand this man over to Satan. Severe suffering. So that his flesh may be destroyed. Serious loss. 
But, if you read on the rest of that verse, but so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. See, he experiences the discipline, he experiences the difficulty, he experiences the loss, but he experiences uh, his spirit being saved on the day of the Lord. He sinned and he suffered greatly, this man, but God was still committed to saving him in eternity and on that great judgment day. And know this, if that describes you, know this, if you keep on sinning, you may well not be saved at all. Your profession may be false. In other words, the disobedient Christian may just be the disobedient. A life marked by ongoing sin is a prime indicator that your profession, Jesus Lord, is false. If you say, Jesus Lord, but refuse to obey him, then how are you any different from the devil? He knows that Jesus is Lord. He's not confused about that topic. He hates it. He disobeys it. But he knows it's true. If that describes you, how are you any different from the devil? Think about it this way. There's a tree. I had to do research for this. There's a tree called the Manchineal uh, tree. And its fruit looks just like little apples. But it is super toxic and super poisonous. And when the Spanish came... Uh, and they found this tree and they ate a bunch of it. They named them Little Apples of Death. Now, if I have a tree with a sign on it that says it's a gala apple tree, but all I produce is poisonous manchineal fruit, then you would soon conclude that's not a gala apple tree and I don't want to eat its fruit. The signage on the front of the tree would not change your opinion. You would look for the fruit. You would look for the outcome. So I say, brothers and sisters in the Lord, do not trust in your signage, in what you declare about yourself. Look at the fruit. As John, uh, 1 John 3, 6 declares, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues in sin has either seen him or knows him. These are the Lord, Lord people. The people who go through life making one profession, living a different way. And on that judgment day, when they go and say, Lord, Lord, they are, as our pastor said, surprised by hell on the day of the Lord. Don't be that person. So in conclusion, what are you supposed to do about all of this? Application. First, partake of the covenant. Whoever confesses with his mouth, Jesus is Lord and believes in his heart, God raised him from the dead, will be saved. Romans 10, 9. It is open to everyone. Not some particular country, not some particular race, not some particular family. Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, Galatians 3, 28. It is open to all. So all should cry out, have mercy on me, a sinner, and be saved. God's love is great and his mercy is rich. And I promise you, it is great enough and rich enough for you. Second application, keep the covenant. We must live all of life in thankful and joyful obedience to God. Confess and renounce your sin as the covenant requires. Proverbs 28, 13. Love what God loves, holiness, and hate what God hates, sin. Study the covenant terms that are found in his words so that you can be careful to know how to please him, how to glorify him with your obedience. Examine yourself to see if you are indeed keeping it and adjust your conduct as needed. In other words, repent. Third, benefit from the covenant. The principal benefit is eternal life, so we can't mess that up. But we can benefit even in this life. The eternal life is the prime benefit of being included within God's covenant. Our brother, Mr. Gooley, is enjoying that benefit even now. But it's not the exclusive benefit. Deuteronomy 28, God promises us that we will be blessed in every way. Blessed in the city. Blessed in the country. The fruit of our wombs, that's our children. Crops and livestock. Baskets and kneading troughs. Blessed when we come in and blessed when we go out. Everything we put our hands to will be blessed. This is abundant prosperity from God. Even our hardships are a blessing. Even our light and momentary troubles will result in our good. 
everything we do will be blessed. God will be with us, with us in Potiphar's house, with us in the prison, and with us as prime minister like Joseph, when, like Joseph, we fear and obey him. He even goes with us as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. God is with us. God is with us now and God is with us forever in glory. Fourth application, receive covenant discipline. We are sinners. We will sin. We will disobey. But God does not abandon us when we sin. Instead, he disciplines us. He disciplines those he loves as sons. Proverbs 3.12 and Hebrews 12.6. So when the discipline comes, receive it. Receive it, repent, and be restored. Don't conceal your sin as Achan did. It may prove, as in that case, that you were not truly born again. But even if you are truly born again, why suffer the prolonged and unnecessary discipline? Why suffer prolonged and unnecessary loss? Stop at weak. Don't progress to sick or fallen asleep. Why have your flesh destroyed? I'm glad that my spirit will be saved. I don't want my flesh to be destroyed. Why go to God as one escaping through the flames? Repent, obey, and instead store up treasure in heaven. Fifth application, advertise the covenant. Simple call to evangelism. Tell others about Jesus, his person, and his work. See, this covenant is a good deal, and it is open to all. Romans 10, 13, all, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So tell others. Tell them we owe an infinite debt to our, uh, for our infinite sin, which we can never repay. And that debt will land us in an eternal hell, which we can never, ever escape. And there is one way out, and it's available today. One way out, the narrow gate, the way of faith, faith in Jesus Christ. So invite all you know to Christ and tell of all his wonderful works. Advertise the covenant. And finally, glory in the covenant. It is not a burden to be part of God's unilateral covenant. It is not a burden. It is a joy. God chose us, zeros, sinners, his enemies who had nothing to offer. And yet before time, he chose us in his great love and rich mercy. We should not ever consider the covenant a burden. We should consider it a joy. We should cry glory. We should cry hallelujah. We should never cease praising the God who elected us, who called us, who redeemed us, who perseveres us, who sanctifies us, and who glorifies us. To him be all glory. Praise the Lord. Our Lord and our God, we give you all glory. We give you all praise for your covenant love to your people. You had need of nothing, and we had need of everything, and you in rich mercy met our need. Praise and glory and honor be to your name. Thank you for your covenant. Thank you for making us your covenant people, and help us to live in such a way as to glorify you and receive blessing and draw others to the covenant of life with you. In Jesus' name, amen.